Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I am so happy to see you all here. Um, my name is Letty Wolf. I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at UC Berkeley. And I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you all tonight for this event, which is featuring our distinguished guest lecturer, Maria Josefina Saldana Portillo, who will present her talk, The Persistent Geography of the Indio Barbaro, which is drawn from the multiply award-winning book, uh, Indian Given, which is actually available um, in the back of the room, courtesy of Eastwind Press. Um, today's event uh, is part of UC Berkeley's Campus Climate Speaker Affirmation and Empowerment Series, which was really generously sponsored by the Division of Equity and Inclusion. Um, I also want to thank the Multicultural Community Center's wonderful co-sponsorship as well. We're always delighted to be here in this beautiful space and really appreciate their labor. Um, I also want to thank our other co-sponsors, the Program in Critical Theory, the Center for Latino Policy Research, and Chicana Chicano and Latina Latino Studies. Let me now introduce um, somebody who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Um, this is Professor Sue Schweik, who is a professor in the Department of English at UC Berkeley. Um, she currently serves as Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities on campus. She's the author of the renowned book, The Ugly Laws, Disability in Public, which the American Historical Review called, quote, a powerful book, essential reading for scholars of disability, race, gender, sexuality, immigration, urban, legal, social movement, and 20th century history more generally. Indeed, for anyone concerned about law and its power and the limits of that power to define borders of belonging. Um, Professor Schweik is currently writing a book tentatively titled Unfixed, How the Women of Glenwood Changed American IQ and Why We Don't Know It. For over 17 years, um, Sue has been integral to many, many initiatives um, on the UC Berkeley campus and to central uh, to center one of them, um, she has been absolutely foundational to the development of disability studies on this campus. Um, she's very involved in the HIFAS Disability Cluster. She was co-coordinator of the Ed Roberts Fellowships in Disability Studies postdoctoral program at UC Berkeley. And she's caught and co-taught multiple courses, both undergraduate and graduate on disability studies. Um, her work has been recognized through multiple awards. Um, she's the recipient of Berkeley's highest award for teaching, the Distinguished Teaching Award. And she's also the recipient of the Berkeley Chancellor's Award for Advancing Institutional Excellence, as well as the UC's Presidential Chair in Undergraduate Education. So I'm really thrilled uh, that Professor Sue Schweik was so happy to have the opportunity to introduce um, our star uh, of tonight, uh, Professor Josie Saldana. So without further ado, Sue Schweik. Hi, I was so honored and pleased to be asked to do this. And it came about, I think, because Josie's ears should be burning, because I was just talking to Letty and other people about Josie's work. And, and, um, and she suggested I, m I might do this. So thank you for that. Um, some of what I'm going to say you just heard. So Maria Josefina Saljano Portillo is professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis and at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at NYU. And she's also, can I just underscore this, one of us, uh, this year she's a visiting professor here, and I really, we are all so much hoping that that visiting is just going to drop off that title very soon. So for everybody, but especially the graduate students in the room, uh, I want to begin this introduction by citing uh, one of Josie's very recent works. It's a contribution to the 2018 Cambridge History of Latino Literature, where she sums up the whole big volume in an epilogue. And in that epilogue, she looks back on, on what she calls the tiny, tidy borders and taxonomies of her qualifying exam reading list uh, 25 years ago to look at the ways in which uh, hemispheric Latino literatures have been decompartmentalized de and reconfigured over this time period. Like so much of her work, uh, that article is really a breathtaking, synthetic, and critical mapping of a truly transnational field uh, 
Um, she is such a, a genuinely, deeply transnational scholar. And the title of that work uh, says it simply, Latino literature, the borders are burning. But not just burning. I want to single out another word in the title of another very recent article in Josie's very long list of publications, and that's drift. And that's from her critical Latinx indigeneities, a paradigm drift, which came out uh, just this past year in Latino studies. So burning borders and paradigm drifting. In that essay, Josie argues that three main schools in recent ethnic studies, prison studies, settler colonialism studies, and migration studies, have failed to think about indigenous peoples in ways that are really essential for those topics. Uh, it's crucial, as some of my coworkers in English have pointed out, to underscore that uh, that title doesn't talk about paradigm shift, it talks about paradigm drift. So if the borders are burning, what's important is everything that's moving in between them and, and filling in those spaces and, and crossing them. So Professor Saldana Pordillo is the author of The Revolutionary Imagination in the Americas and the Age of Development, which came out from Duke in 2003, and then Indian Given, and you've already heard about the awards uh, that Indian Given has received, um, and one that wasn't mentioned was it's on the short list for the British International Studies Association and International Political Economy Group Association. Just the range of places that have found this work essential is so striking, and so it makes sense when you read the book. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how the book transforms understanding of how to think about indigeneity, because in a minute you are going to get a sense of exactly that. Um, Josie has just done so much work. Just a few other examples uh, that you can go find. Uh, she's got another co-edited book now under contract with Aunt Lute, Sandino's Queer Cousin, An Oral History of Living, Loving, and Organizing During the Sandinista Regime. Uh, she's bringing out two massive digital editions for RJ Publico's Press, uh, Digital Humanities Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project. And each one of those two editions uh, transcribes and um, translates into English then and comments upon and reprints um, 800 18th century primary documents, one for South Texas, one for North Texas, an incredible resource. And there's all this work on much more recent history, too, and then on all the ways that those histories are all bound together. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, about, um, I think, the last thing I read by Josie, which was in um, our major literary studies journal, PMLA, on the work of Jean Franco. And it just feels really good to invoke Jean Franco's name here. Uh, and along with Josie's. And uh, that project is on Franco's work across time on cruel modernity, on what Josie calls cruel coloniality, and the call to refuse, a call that Saldana's work is. Uh, and she's now at work on what's just going to be such an important book. Uh, which I think you can even tell from the working title, which is NAFTA and Narcos, or How Free Trade Brought Us the Drug Trade. Um, and I want to tell you just one thing that I found out about this project. Um, in 2016, Josie went to work at the South Texas Residential Center in Dilly, Texas, uh, where she volunteered and did work with a nonprofit that assists women and children who are held in detention there, who are incarcerated there after fleeing from drug-related violence. Uh, and at one point, I read something she wrote where she talked about wanting to ground her scholarly work in that actual place with those people in order to try to theorize what she called their place in the complicated story that she's telling in that book without instrumentalizing them. Uh, I'm really honored to be in the room, uh, and I hope I'm going to be in the rooms for a long time with Josie Saldana Portillo.
Thank you so, so much for that amazing and generous introduction, Sue. I'm, I'm a little terribly embarrassed, but um, uh, it's so, um, it was so generous of you and good of you. Um, and actually, on the last talk, on the next project, the last talk, next week on Wednesday at noon, I'm actually presenting that re research at the Schraub House. Um, and I'll put it up at the last slide. It was supposed to be another book talk, but I'm not going to give a book talk because I'm just giving this book talk. So it's going to be actually on the um, work I've been doing with uh, those ladies in the um, Dilly Residential Cent Residential Center, um, and uh, look at a little bit of the next project, the next book. So I want to begin by thanking Sue and by thanking Letty for organizing this, and also by thanking the Center for Race and Gender for inviting me as part of this distinguished lecture series, as well as the um, climate uh, Campus Climate Speaker Series for co-hosting and all of the other wonderful organizations that I wasn't aware were also um, helping to bring me here. Uh, well, I mean, I'm already here, but to bring me here to you today. Um, uh, I, um, uh, Professor Vope invited me to speak on the persistence of the trope of the murderous Mexican that we see recalled with such ease by the Trump administration. And just recently, for example, when he referred to the very well organized annual caravan of 1,200 Central American asylum seekers, Trump insisted that these women and children were being raped repeatedly as they moved northward in the caravan, regardless of the fact that this was absolutely not the case, as this caravan is organized by immigrant uh, support networks, including the Catholic clergy of Central America, Mexico, and the United States. But Trump nevertheless is able to draw up that image of marauding rapists precisely because of the myth of the Indio Barbaro that was developed in the Southwest borderlands, but has so infected the US national imaginary that right now women and children as far north as North Dakota are bolting their doors in fear of Trump's callous and flippant representation of Mexicans and Central Americans. As a recurring motif in US political life, the murderous Mexican slash Indio Barbaro has been deployed for the last 200 years of the nation's existence whenever it was politically uh, useful. But of course, this trope is fully developed in the 1846 war, when President Polk had to, in, to provoke a very reluctant Congress into a war of aggression against Mexico. So as uh, has been talked about, my book, Indian Given, Racial Geographies Again Across Mexico and the United States, traces the development of this myth or trope of the Indio Barbaro actually from the beginning of European conquest on the continent through the contemporary drug war that is jointly sponsored by the US and Mexican uh, governments. My original interest in the topic uh, for this book was actually the marked visible difference in the way in which Mexico and the United States racialized indigenous populations. I was motivated by a fairly simple question in writing this book. Why is it that indigenous people in Mexico are recognized as part of the nation in such a markedly different way than indigenous peoples in the United States? Why do we think of Mexico as a place teeming with Indians, in other words, and the United States as a place bereft of them? The most common sense explanation um, that is usually given is the demographic one. Oh, it's because there were so many more Indians in Mexico than in the United States when the Europeans arrived. Uh, but even if this was the case, the geog that the geography of Mexico, of central Mexico, was more greatly populated than the geography of North America, there were still millions millions of Northern uh, American indigenous peoples in uh, the United States, what is now the United States and Canada when the colonists arrived. So answering this question is what motivated me in writing Indian Given. But along the way, uh, the book became an investigation of how the image of the Indio Barbaro became a dominant trope or mythical figure in the imagination of both Mexico and the United States. Importantly, this figure of the Indio Barbaro 
Barbaro isn't confined to the borderlands, though this is where we most frequently encounter him. Rather, the image of the Indio Barbaro, for very specific historical reasons, conditions the way in which we also see Muslim others in the Middle, Muslim others in the Middle East. And as evidence of this confluence between the Muslim mother and the Indio Barbaro, on May 2nd, 2011, U.S. Na Navy SEAL Team 6 killed Osama bin Laden during a raid on his family pa compound in Pakistan. The SEAL team leader informed President Obama about the success of the mission with the phrase, quote, for God and country, Geronimo, Geronimo, Geronimo. It remains unclear whether Geronimo was shorthand for the mission, for bin Laden, or for the act of killing bin Laden. What is clear is that the name Geronimo linked bin Laden's evasion of the U.S. military and intelligence community for almost 10 years at the beginning of the 21st century with the Apache leader's evasion of the U.S. and Mexico, Mexican militaries for over 10 years at the end of the 19th. Though separated by more than a century of U.S. global warfare, this speech act linking a Christian God to our nation Nation also linked the Muslim and Native American as terrorists. Osama and Geronimo were very savvy and resourceful, perhaps even brave, but ultimately they were linked as terrorists who were beaten in the, into the country's mem military memory and popular imagination. Just a few days later, on May 9, 2011, tens of thousands of Mexicans filled Mexico City Socalo to welcome the March for Peace with Justice and Dignity, arriving after a five-day journey on foot from Cuernavaca, Morelos. Those marching were the families and friends of victims claimed by Mexico's drug war. The peace marchers demanded an end to the criminal impunity and justice for their dead. But their chief demand was for then-President Felipe Calderón to bring his misbegotten policy of war against the northern cartel leaders to an end, asking instead that, Cal that Calderón enter into peace negotiations with the cartels in order to reestablish the country's security. Calderón responded by saying that while he was happy to enter into a dialogue with the good people of the peace movement, he would never enter into peace negotiations with, quote, esos bárbaros del norte, end quote. Though separated by over a century, Calderón's speech act linked the 21st century narco with the 19th century Apache and Comanche through historical illusion, as these equestrian tribes were the originals Bárbaros del Norte, who waged su successful war between 1830 and 1870 against the Mexican state in an effort to expand their own territories. These two speech acts, Obama's and Calderon's, separated by only a matter of days in 2011, foreground the transnational histories of war against the Apache and the Comanche that link United States and Mexican statecraft. Both countries used wars with and against the equestrian, equestrian nations, the Indios Barbaros de la Frontera, to consolidate their own national boundaries. In the early 19th century, the U.S. military enjoined the equestrian nations to raid Mexican towns, northern Mexican towns, and pueblos for the lucrative trade in horses and captives, thereby preparing the way for the U.S. War of Aggression against Mexico in 80, 1846 by devastating the community of Mexicans along Mexico's northern frontier. In response, the state governments of Durango, Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Sonora formed militias and offered generous bounties for the scalps or heads of Apache, Comanche, Siri, and Kiowa warriors, paradoxically pr protecting northern Mexico against some of its original inhabitants. U.S. mercenaries, runaway U.S. slaves, re and relocate North American Indians joined these process posses, uh, scalp posses, by the hundreds in exchange for Mexican citizenship and land, a 19th century DACA, if you will. But so did Mexican Indians who were traditional enemies of the Apache and Comanche and who solidified their enfranchisement into the, enfranchisement into the Mexican nation by committing these inaugural acts of violent belonging. Through these posses and scalping policies, the fledgling nation constituted a distinctly multiracial citizenry against the threatening backdrop of Indios Barbaros.
Scalping and beheading were an early form of statecraft for both nations, though, for once the war with, US, with Mexico ended, the U.S. and Mexican militaries joined forces against these Indios Barbaros and finally against Jeronimo and his Chiricahua Apache. Until this last band of savage tribes was pacified and brought into reservation status at the end of the 19th century. The speech acts of the Navy SEAL to Obama and of Calderon to the national media not only remind us of this transnational complicity between the national media, um, between the two nations, they also demonstrate the afterlife of the Indio Barbaro, who forever haunts the racial geography of both nations. And indeed, although the genealogy of the Indio Barbaro, and particularly of the Barbaro del Norte, can be traced to a specific geography of what today we call the Southwest, as a concept metaphor for a foreign agent threatening God and country, it has traveled far afield from its original homeland. Heterotemporally and, met and multispatially, the Indio Barbaro Savage Apache has migrated to the present day Middle East, but also to Central Mexico and to Central America, signaling again and again a threat at the very heart of the nation and presaging a need for ever greater militarization of the US and Mexico's southern borders in the 21st century. The conjoining of the Muslim and narco-terrorist through the myth of the Indio Barbaro explains why Trump's only two immigration policies to date are against Muslim refugees, the band, and undocumented Mexicans, the end of DACA. A racial unconscious expresses itself in Trump's contemporary iteration of the Indio Barbaro, who gravely threatens to turn the U.S. into Trump's hellscape of rape, murder, drug, and domestic jihad. The figure of the Indian, though, has deep, a deep genealogy in the British and Spanish colonial archives, one that initially produced very different representations of the racial nation in Mexico and the United States. So Indian Given analyzes several of the constitutive moments in the colonial and national histories of these two countries from the period of 1550 to 2014 to demonstrate how indigenous identity came to meet some different things in the United States and Mexico, but also to show how the two nations colluded in producing the myth of the Indio Barbaro to suit the various needs of their imperial nationalisms. Chronologically, I begin with the inquiry into the nature of indigenous humanity that was staged for the Spanish crown at Valladolid, Valladolid Spain, between 1550 and 1552. In light of conquistador abuses of indigenous peoples brought to his attention, King uh, Carlos the, of Spain, who was also the Holy Roman Empire of the, at the time, suspended further conquest by Spanish soldiers while the nature of indigenous peoples and the proper modes of conquest could be adjudicated. He convened a panel of 14 jurists and theologians to listen to evidence from both sides, those who believed in just war against Indians and those who believed that war against the Indians viola violated both natural law and capital. Catholic doctrine. Bartolomé de las Casas argued that the Indians were so fully human that they merited Spain requesting, respecting, that they merited Spain's respecting their property and political organizations, while Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda argued that they were, they were slaves in the Aristotelian sense. This is a very important moment, I argue, for the fate of indigenous peoples in Latin America because las Casas won the debate obvs, because all of you have heard of Las Casas, and who of you knows who Ginés de Sepúlveda was? Very few of you, I think. Uh, but also because Las Casas argued that even barbarous Indians were not bereft of reason, and therefore were not true savages. Rather, barbarous Indians simply have, had yet to be persuaded to the Christian faith, but were entirely capable of persuasion because they possessed reason. For Spanish colonialism, then, the Indio Barbaro came to have a fairly narrow meaning, those Indians who refused to be relocated into pueblos, or towns, and or those who refused to join the Christian faith and rejected Spanish authority. Thus, they use Indios Barbaros and Indios Infieles almost interchangeably. Indios Infieles are unfaithful Indians. 
Why is this significant? Because it shows that even from the beginning of Spanish colonialism, indigenous peoples were always already about to be included in Christian unity, right? Always already ready to be included. Either indigenous, indigenous peoples were indios fieles, faithful Indians, who had already submitted to the crown and church, or they were indios barbaros, indios infieles, awaiting conversion. Meanwhile, indigenous peoples played a very different role in the United States' own colonial history. Here, British settlers initially recognized indigenous peoples as sovereign nations, but with a very different end in mind. If indigenous peoples were the sovereign owners of their lands of the American continent, then they could sell them to British settlers, sell those lands. And indeed, there are thousands of documented cases of indigenous peoples in all along the Northeast selling or, set, or ceding their lands to British settlers in individual sales. Though obviously the terms of the sales were highly fraudulent, and in the book I talk about all the different fraudulent ways in which lands were quote unquote sold by indigenous peoples, even though that, that understanding of private property or sale were not shared commonly. Still, it was important for the British colonists to understand themselves as treating the Indians justly, even though they did, in fact, think they were savages for lacking religious faith. So my conclusions in the chapter are that, in part, the representations that Spanish and British colonizers projected onto indigenous peoples largely depended on their own interest and fulfilled their own desires of what to see on the, la on the landscape. So the next chapter analyzes the petitions for settlement of northern Texas by Spanish settlers in the early 18th century, as well as the reports about indigenous inhabitants of the region sent to the Viceroy of New Spain that were written by Christianizing priests. These accounts document in, in anthropological detail, hence their 800 pages, each one, uh, the indigenous population um, uh, for the Spanish Empire. And the indigenous people are always about to be subjects for that empire, right? The indigenous population is always an anticipating the how they're represented, anticipating the arrival of the Spanish, hailed by the Spanish to come to them, and indeed even, um, you know, invited to join in a kind of proto-Christian unity with the indigenous people. So the Spaniards represented the uh, landscape as an entrepot of European and indigenous cultures, languages, and exchange. It was a very vibrant landscape, which in contrast, when the Anglo-Americans start moving in in the early 19th century, uh, was represented by them as devoid of indigenous life. Instead, all they saw was this kind of motley crew of Mexicans of dubious character, dubious moral character. And so at this mo at this juncture, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, we still have Mexico representing the landscape as filled with indigenous peoples, um, and the Anglo settlers that are being incorporated into Texas, wanting Texas to become a slave state, seeing only Mexicans uh, that are impeding their uh, their impeding slavery, right? Impeding Mexico becoming this Texas becoming a slave state because at that stage, uh, Mexico has already outlawed slavery. Um, so the next chapter turns to the formation of the nation state in Mexico and the U United States, and as I told you a little bit about, examines um, the, the the posses that were sent to uh, you know to eliminate uh, the the Comanche. And just to give you a sense, um, that's what uh, New Spain looked like um, right bef at the right before independence. So you can see how much of the territory is. Um, you know, dedicated, uh, how much of the territory is taken um, by the U.S. War of Aggression. Here we have what was the Comancheria. It's actually bigger than that. I think that's actually a little bit, um, it, it makes it smaller than it is. And you can also see where the Comanche raiding zones are, right? So that's the contested territory. It's contested as, you know, your own Professor Brian DeLay in the History Department has written a book on War of the Thousand Deserts. It's contested territory between the Ang Anglo-Americans, the Mexicans, and the Comanche. And the Apache also are trying to maintain their territory south of the Comancheria. And so together they're raiding Mexican territories in the hope of, of, of of keeping everything together. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit. Um, uh, 
one of the reasons that I argue for the joint after the end of the U.S.-Mexico war for the joint military, one of the things that the joint military exercises or uh, elimination of the uh, Apache, Apache and Comanche, the reducing of them into uh, reservation status, part of what that helps to do is to smooth over the divisions between Mexico and the United States. In other words, the joint venture re-solidifies the bond between the two countries at the expense of the Indios Barbaros, right? So in chapters um, four and five, I consider the lasting impact of the Indio Barbaro on the daily lives of who is left behind in the Southwest after uh, the Southwest is annexed by the United States. And that is the Mexicans, the Mestizo Mexicans, Afro-Mestizo Mexicans, and the indigenous Mexicans. And through a series of illegal cases that I examine in those two chapters, I show the way in which, whereas the U.S., whereas Mexico, and indeed writes into the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that all Mexican citizens must be treated as U.S. citizens, right, when they give the territory over in the peace treaty, uh, at that point, us Afro-Mestizos, indigenous, and mestizo subjects are all all male subjects are all considered fully enfranchised citizens. They can run for office, they can vote, they can own property, they can have all sorts of different jobs. Um, but of course, when the United States annexes that population through a series of cases, uh, it reduces and reduces what Mexican citizenship meant. Like contrary to all historical evidence, it reduces it to really only white Mexicans, right? And those are like, and I'm sure there's some good people too. When Trump says, you know, they're rapists, they're murderers, and I'm sure there's some good people too. We can see that that's what's operative, right? Like Afro-Mestizos that were Mexican citizens and indigenous peoples that were Mexican citizens get lumped into this Indio Barbaro character category, I think, even in the contemporary imagination. But more important, legally, they are devoid, they're d divested of all their rights, especially their rights to hold office, their rights, uh, their electoral rights and what and whatnot. And then, you know, you actually, there are all these cases of Californians having to go and prove that they're less than 132nd, 132nd percentage Indian or, 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 or African in order to be able to keep the rights of their white citizenship. And there are these courts that somehow decide this, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, I talk about that in the chapters. Anyway, so um, I'm now going to go on and give you a little, uh, the, the, uh, the ending, a little section from the ending of the book, which brings us into the present uh, of 2014. Um, it's called Nafta and Narcos, and it kind of uh, segues into the next project. So narco and Muslim terrorists are regularly brought together by government officials to justify defense budgets on the basis of their joint threat. But it is the figure of the Indio Barbaro that ultimately enables this threat to cohere. State Department and Pentagon officials, for example, routinely testify before Congress that drug trafficking threatens U.S. national security because profits could potentially fund jihadist terrorist organizations. This connection might strike some as improbable, given that Latin American drug lords are often explicit in their Christian devotion and notorious for their conservative politics. Nevertheless, this line of argumentation predates 9-11, as both the Reagan and Clinton administrations signed executive orders that strengthen joint anti-drug and anti-terrorist enforcement. The United States has spent over $1 trillion on the war on drugs in Latin America since the 1970s, with over $20 billion spent in the last decade alone. Military and police aid to Latin America peaked at $1.6 billion in 2010, with Mexico receiving over $500 million as the top aid recipient for that year. While U.S. military and police aid to the region declined under Obama due to tightening budgets, today Latin America receives more yearly military and police aid than it did in any single year at any point during the Cold War. So let that sink in for those of you who are perhaps old enough to remember the Cold War and its damaging effects on Latin America. We have more than 4,000 U.S. military troops on the ground in Latin America, as well as additional agents from at least 10 other law enforcement agencies. 
There is constant U.S. naval and Air Force surveillance of sea and sky as well. Like the Pentagon the State Dep and the State Department, Homeland Security argues for increased budgets in order to protect the United States from jihadi terrorists who might mix themselves up among the undocumented immigrants crossing the southern border. For this reason, Homeland Security absorbed the Border Patrol, transforming it in the process. Homeland Security has more than doubled the number of border Border Patrol agents along the southwest border, from 9,100 in 2001 to more than 18,500 today. Moreover, Homeland Security has also militarized the border with advanced weaponry and technology and surveillance technology as surplus military equipment developed for surveillance and intelligence gathering in Iraq and Afghanistan finds its way to the U.S.-Mexico border. Drones now patrol the entire 2,000-mile southern U.S. border at all times. By way of contrast, the Border Patrol has only 2,200 agents <coughs> patrolling the more than 5,500-mile 5 Canadian border, and drones survey less than 1,000 of those miles, even though this is the border that 9-11 ter terrorists breached. The Border Patrol has yet to capture a single jihadist crossing into the United States from Mexico, though agents kill several Mexican citizens per year, in the double digits actually, including some who were very clearly on the Mexican side of the border with absolutely no intention of crossing it. Night vision goggles, drones, and M16s are all trained on undocumented Mexican, Mexican immigrants looking for work, but it's the figure of the Indio Barbaro that em enables this racialized distribution of force. It is not just a generic fear of a brown planet that leads to the milita militarization of the southern border, but an unconscious yet ever-present fear of the Mexican as the Indio Barbaro, of the Indio Barbaro as the foreign terrorist, that leads to this disproportionate distribution of resources to protect the U.S. from Mexico's supposed criminal aliens. And just to underscore our racialized hermeneutic, millions of pounds of marijuana enter the U.S. from Canada every year, and Canada is the leading supplier of ecstasy, which is often laced with highly addictive methamphetamines and is the drug of choice for white U.S. citizens between the ages of 19 and 39. Meanwhile, El Paso, Texas is, considerably, is, is, con is consistently ranked as the safest city in the United States. And Laredo, the city that I'm from, is like, I don't know, fourth or fifth. We have heard so very much from Donald Trump about U.S. citizens losing their jobs to factories relocated to Mexico. But the irony is that millions of Mexicans who crossed the border since 1994 have done so because they lost their jobs as a consequence of NAFTA as well. 2014 marked the 20th anniversary of NAFTA, and as we know, it required the elimination of all Mexican subsidies to small farmers. With industrially, industrially produced basic grains, including corn, flooding the Mexican market from Canada and the United States, a conservatively estimated 2.5 million farmers were displaced from agricultural production in Mexico by 2005. As Latin American is snow, when a Mexican farmer abandons his farm, it has a multiplying effect. As, farms, as a farm inev invariably employs family labor and seasonal itinerant labor. Thus, it should have come as no great surprise when by 2004, within the first 10 years of NAFTA, again a conservatively estimated 8 million Mexicans had migrated to the United States in search of work. 96% of Mexican municipalities have sent migrants to the United States. A significant percentage of this migration has been by indigenous peoples, and thus farms across our nation employ entire communities of Chol, Tojolabal, Sotzil, or Setzals from Chiapas, who in some cases work in conditions of debt peonage or indentured servitude. But peasants are not alone, as Mexicans have also abandoned urban centers because Mexico is deindustrializing as an effect of NAFTA. NAFTA created a little over a half a million jobs in the maquiladora industry over the last 25 years. <clears throat> 
Mexican air exports to the United States have been growing accordingly. The value of trade between Mexico and the U.S. has increased by a factor of 10. U.S. exports to Mexico increased from $41 billion in 1993 to $226 billion in 2013, an increase of well over 400%. Mexican exports to the United States, meanwhile, increased from $40 billion in 1993 to $280 billion in 2013, an increase of over 600,000, uh, 600%, I'm sorry. Um, in 2016, trade between the two countries exceeded $550 billion, and every day, $1.6 billion worth of trade occurs between the two countries. Indeed, the U.S. is currently running an import-export deficit with Mexico, causing U.S. blue-collar workers so much stress that they elected Donald Trump as president. But while this trade deficit should presumably bode well for Mexico, when Lund looks more carefully at the statistics, a very different picture emerges. It is true that Mexico exports more value-added goods to the United States today than before NAFTA. However, thus does, this does not imply an intensification or extension of industrialization in Mexico, as one might imagine. Rather, it's having the opposite effect for two reasons. Most of the value added to Mexican exports isn't added in Mexico, as Mexican maquiladoras perform the very last step in the production process, assembling inputs from other countries into the final product to be shipped to the United States. Thus, Mexican maquilas add but a tiny percentage of the value added to the commodity. Mexico's increase in value-added exports disguises the fact that the majority of the value added to the product is added outside of Mexico and consequently leaves very little profit for taxation or technological know-how in the country. If you read it, the book, it will be more detailed and clearly explained. But I'm just giving you the quick version. Uh, it is, but it is the flood of imports in consumer durables from the United States and Canada that is destroying Mexico's domestic industry. Of course, domestic is a very quaint term in our neoliberal present, but 25% of Mexico's domestic industries have had to shutter their factory doors because they simply could not compete with goods that were produced transnationally under the flexible production schemes at rock bottom prices of globalization. When these kinds of factories close, it's particularly devastating on the economy because their supply and distribution chains are almost entirely domestic, that is, composed of Mexican capital and inputs and employing domestic labor. It's also domestic industry that absorbs skilled labor and produces technological no innovation. Maquiladoras, by contrast, are highly parasitical, as almost all inputs that go into the production process used by the factory and the technology these inputs embody are imported into Mexico. The and entire factories will be imported and set up, and none of the products that are go into the making of that factory are produced in Mexico, or almost none. Thus, unlike domestic factories that produce for domestic consumption and for export, developing domestic know-how in the process, maquilas leave no technological know-how behind, nor do they create forward and backward linkages that multiply economic growth within the country. This is why when China demands that U.S. corporations leave their technological know-how behind, Mind, this is why. Because they know how this narrative plays out. I mean, we've seen it over and over again in the last 80 years. So this is partly why they blackmail U.S. companies to leave them their technological know-how, because otherwise they would just take that with them or keep it under wraps. While it is true that maquilas pay much more than Mexico's daily domestic min minimum wage, it's also true that, the ma that maquilas, by law, Pay, must pay less than the domestic unionized industry in Mexico. Thus, the increase in overall wages due to maquilas is more than offset by the decline in wages due to the closing of domestic factories that cannot compete with imports. For Mexican economist Raúl Weiss Delgado, Na NAFTA, and particularly the maquila industry it enabled, have cheapened Mexican labor power dramatically by de-skilling jobs and eliminating other avenues for employment. I believe you get, begin to see just one of the ways in which NAFTA has fueled the drug economy by prov prov providing a proletariat desperate and ready for, for an employment along the border. But NAFTA enables the drug economy in other significant ways. The tremendous increase in commodities flowing across the border makes it very easy to move drugs. 
Only 2% of the cross of the b- cargo crossing the border ever gets inspected. And let me tell you, as a girl from Laredo, I'm glad I did not know that because I might have chosen an t- entirely different career path. Uh, Uh, Anyway, to inspect more than 2% of the cargo would cause huge bottlenecks, slow down production times, and lead to spoilage. The other way in which free trade uh, facilitates the drug trade is that it has also made it significantly easier to launder money. U.S. foreign direct investment in Mexico between 1989 and 1993 averaged $4.3 billion per year. In 2012, that figure had ballooned to over $100 billion. It is ridiculously easy to repatriate money to the drug cartels as foreign direct investment from the United States. And extremely difficult to keep drug capital and all other forms of capital separate. Thus, every year, and I love this figure, every year the Mexican banking system has an average of $10 billion that it cannot account for through GDP remittances or petroleum exports. So those are the, supposedly the three, you know, principal avenue, ways of producing it. So NAFTA set millions of Mexicans in motion, looking for work from the countryside to the city, from the cities to the maquiladoras on the border, from the maquiladoras to the United States. This is the new geography of globalization, a geography of motion that has emptied the countryside and filled up the urban spaces in Mexico and the United States, but also in Central America and the Caribbean. It's a racial geography of neoliberalism that has displaced indigenous peoples on a massive scale and is transforming the demographic makeup of the United States. NAFTA created a precarious life for the vast majority of Mexicans, and thus it should surprise no one that a portion of this vulnerable population would choose to migrate north north, to take up service jobs that proliferate in the increasingly gentrified and wealthy cities of the United States. But it should surprise us even less that a portion of this vulnerable young population chooses to take up lucrative careers in the drug economy that thrives in the shadow of NAFTA. Arguably, like the Apache and the Comancha before them, these drug dealers facilitate trade in illicit goods sought after by a gluttonous U.S. citizenry. In the 19th century, the Apache and the Comancha before them uh, like, like uh, I'm sorry, um, arguably, like the Apache and the Comanche, I already said that. Right, in the 19th century, the Apache and Comanche raided Mexican ranches for horses, cattle, and captives that fetched a dear price from European settlers and dislocated in- Eastern Indians pouring into the Great Plains. So that's Indian territory, and it's a well, in 1930s, and it's you have the um, the Eastern tribes being moved into it, squishing the people who were there already, and of course uh, European immigrants going as well. And all of this was actually these. Are, this is who bought the horses and the captives from the Comanche and the Apache. This was their main uh, their main um, uh, well, the people who bought the stuff. Anyway. Um, so, uh, right, they fetch dear price and they're pouring into the Grain Plains. Today, these narcotraficantes bring us cocaine, heroin, and marijuana from the factories in Colombia and the fields in Mexico that fetch such a dear price from casual users and junkies who proliferate in U.S. Sub- suburbs and cities alike. Rather than recognizing these narcos as model entrepreneurs responding to the laws of supply and demand, our demand to be specific, we instead vilify them using the same language and tropes that were used against the Indios Barbaros del Norte in the 19th century. Narcos are aberrations of humanity, engaging in improper trade with improper methods, who should be excised from the borderlands at all cost, requiring the joint efforts of the Mexican and U.S. military to do so. For the Mexican bourgeoisie, los narcos son unas bestias que no merecen ser parte de la nación y la humanidad. And just as the U.S. does not negotiate with terrorists, Mexican presidents do not negotiate with barbarians. For half of the U.S. electorate, the Mexican immigrant is also engaging in improper trade with improper methods and should be excised from the U.S. nation at all cost. These migrants trade themselves, smuggling their cheapened labor across the border at great cost to their personal safety. And of course, every Mexican immigrant looking for work is potentially a bad hombre looking for his next victim. And thus Trump wins by promising to extend the 700-mile wall that already covers one-third of the border between the U.S. and Mexico. 
Here, the old racial geography of the borderlands informs the new as a simplistic economic explanation, as a simplistic explanation of the economic restructuring brought upon both countries by NAFTA and the drug economy it enables. So the next section of the talk I have to warn you presents some very disturbing images from the drug war, and so I advise you that you should turn away or perhaps leave if you don't want to see them. Uh, if one enters narco beheadings into any search engine, tens of thousands of images of defiled corpses fills one screen. Beheaded corpses, scalped corpses, dismembered corpses, corpses with their eyes gouged out, or with the Z of the Seta cartel carved in their torsos and back backs. Corpses come with notes pinned to their chests with a knife or with a knife or written on the body with a marker explaining the offense that these that led to such terrible death. One might imagine that corpses are beheaded to prevent identification. One would be wrong, as the head is not removed from the scene, but rather cleverly arranged to punctuate it. In one photo, two skulls are cradled by forearms with hands their corresponding scalps delicately placed above the scene on the railing of a bridge. To ensure identification, the accompanying sign informs, it that, informs us that these two are El Chino and El Fantasma and lives their crimes against the cartel. Who of us didn't have a friend in high school called El Chino? In another, for, in another uh, photo, Four heads are arranged in a row along the windshield of a car that reads, quote, Ultima letra, captura y ejecuta, ejecuta a asesinos devastadores. The hood of the car, directly in front of the skulls, reads, a pun on the name of the executioner to suggest these four men, all with their eyes closed, are just sleeping. In another photograph, two corpses lean up against each other on a street corner, the heads of each completely flayed. They have been arranged to look like two drunks sleeping it off with cigarettes hanging where their lips, lipless teeth are and with ridiculous sombreros atop their bald heads, the cartels parodying a parody of the lazy Mexican. Perhaps their crime was not working hard enough to secure the expected rate of return, or perhaps they used too much of the product themselves. There is no helpful caption explaining their deaths. What is made clear by these photographs is that these executions are public events. They are not private adjudications of crime syndicates, but the public policing of a population. Indeed, in several of the photos, there are crowds surrounding the scene of execution. The narcos, you can see the chanclas and the, and the, and the bicycle at the top. The narcos upload real-time photos of their crimes themselves from their cell phones. These staged scenes of performative violence slash justice are not only directed at local communities intimidated into submission, but at the entire world that has access to the internet. They connote a spectacular and absolute form of territorial justice, established precisely because, quote, it pursues the body beyond all possible pain, end quote. That's a quote from Foucault. These narrative scenes set the parameters in script, in blood, and in body parts of what happens should you violate narco law. Thus, this kind of death is not limited to cartel cadre, but illustrative of a general, if unwritten, code of behavior that must be followed by everyone within cartel territory. In, a noter in another photograph, seven men are arranged in a semicircle on a main rotary in Urapan, um, Michoacán. They sit on plastic chairs, their, eye, their eyes covered, their bodies showing no visible sign of torture, a merciful death. Attached to several of the corpses' chests with knives are posters that read, Advertencia. Esto les pasa, les va a pasar a todos los asaltantes, rateros de coches, casa, habitación, tras fuentes, así como secuestradores, violadores y extorsionistas. This is what happens to all thieves of cars, assaults, those who steal houses, quit, uh, kidnap people and violate or and extort them. The cartels thus claim exclusive power to inflict violence as punishment in their system of justice, prohibiting others from the actions they, that are their sole purview, but also establishing the cartel as the protector of the civilian population from common criminals. Another performative scene establishes the parameters of per per permissible speech within the realm. 
In September 2011, a group of three social media activists were killed in Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, for reporting on Zeta violence in the city. With over 80 journalists killed or disappeared during Calderon's presidency, Nuevo Laredo journalists had understandably stopped reporting on cartel activities. Filling the void were three young bloggers, including La Nena de Laredo, Maria Elizabeth Macias, who informed the public on where shootouts were transpiring, who was targeted and why, how to evade checkpoints, etc. Two were strung up from a pedestrian bridge in Nuevo Laredo, one disemboweled and hogtied, the other's arm almost severed and hung from his feet. The most spectacular assassination was reserved for Macias, who was suspected of providing information to the attorney general and the Mexican military passed along to her by her internet fans. La Nena's decapitated body was found in Nuevo Laredo Zócalo, partially undressed to show that the skin on her back had been flayed and to suggest that she had been raped. Her head was mounted on a large spherical sculptor in the plaza. Her keyboard arranged to hang around what had been her neck and her mouth in her, her mouse in her mouth. The poster accompanied her accompanying her body conveyed the following. Okay, Nuevo Laredo en vivo y redes sociales. Yo soy la nena de Laredo y aquí estoy por mis reportes y los suyos. Para los que no quieran creer, esto me pasó por mis acciones, por confiar en Sedena y Marina. Gracias por sus atenciones, la nena de Laredo. Macias' contagious, courageous voice was silenced when the Setas assassinated her, as is emblemized, emblemized by the mouth, mouse shoved in her mouth. Yet the Setas usurp her speech when they write the attached note in the first person, ventriloquizing her voice to articulate their law, their punishment pursuing her body beyond the point of death. She speaks in blood and print on their behalf to silence future political speech. After seeing these images of narco violence, of the violence that pursues the victim beyond death with torch and defilement, torture and defilement of the body, it is so easy to say, que barbaros. It's even easier to avert one's eyes, to turn away, to refuse to see. And yet the scenes of violence that are staged in parks and on rotaries and bridges at the entrances of towns demand that bystanders look and understand the power they convey. These spectacular displays are a modern form of statecraft in that they are a mode of taking possession of the sovereignty of the state in a Foucauldian sense. The, the, perpetrators, the perpetrators of this violent decide who dies but also who lives and how they should live. These scenes of violence are a management technique, setting the parameters of media representation or acting as a deterrent to petty crime. They denote a territorial control of one's market and establish the boundaries of acceptable political beyond belonging. Just in case we are tempted to say that this kind of violence is proof positive that Mexico has become ungovernable, let us remember the events of September 14th, uh, September 2014 in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero, for where 43 students were disappeared and probably killed for their political protesting. Ayotzinapa is a teacher's college reserved for the children of peasants who are trained as primary, secondary, and high school teachers. The students were protesting tuition hikes, a tradition for Mexican university students who are accustomed to free higher education. They were also demanding guaranteed employment after graduation, as budget cuts had severely shrunk the positions available for teachers in rural schools. Given the devastation of small farming in Mexico, rural teachers' colleges arguably provide the only remaining legal avenue to alternative employment for the children of farmers. Evidently, the town mayor did not like the fact that the students were flying in the face of neoliberal restructuring and demanding that the state provide employment and education. Or perhaps he did not like the fact that the alternative employment, this alternative employment threatened the pool of labor reserved for the drug economy from which he benefited directly. Whatever the case may be, he ordered the local police to kidnap the students and hand them over to the cartel presumably so that they might be killed and the police followed their orders. I bring this case to our attention not to demonstrate the lawlessness of Mexico, but rather to underscore that the drug economy is the new law, 
It not only provides new sources of employment, much needed sources of employment, but these deaths make evident that political power and economic power are still one in Mexico. With the drug economy comes a new form of governmentality practicing institutionalized forms of violence carried out jointly by the local police, national military officers, and cartel henchmen to defend the territorial boundaries and political interests of the cartels and their allies in official government positions. This would be the moment to remind us that it was the state governments of Sonora, Coahuila, Durango, and Nuevo León that established beheadings and scalpings as a form of modern statecraft in the 19th century. After establishing their bounty programs, all four states set up commissions to check the scalps and heads brought to their state treasuries for payments. These commissions checked for distinguishing tattoos and patterns of head shavings used by the equestrian tribes. Although, of course, there was no way to ascertain whether the dead were in fact participating in raiding parties. Towns in these states regularly held parades to welcome the returning posses, where bounty hunters prominently displayed the, scalp, the scalps, heads, and regalia of the dead. It would be easy to end here, implying that Mexico's history of war against northern indigenous peoples haunts these scenes of narco violence, and this wouldn't be entirely incorrect, as the narcos clearly borrow from a familiar lexicon of state making in their staged and spectacular displays of their enemies. However, this would be an incorrect conclusion, as it would wrongly trace the source of all this violence to the ever-present, if repressed, figure of the Indio Barbaro del Norte. Instead, as with all things, if one wants to get to the heart of the matter, one should follow the money, as Javier Cecilia's peace movement did in 2012. That year, the peace movement that quickly sprang up around Cecilia's deeply personal but broadly representative loss embarked on a 600-mile journey, a caravan for peace with justice and dignity, across the United States, bringing attention to their cause and to the need for a negotiated solution to the drug war. The caravan, made up entirely of the families of the killed and disappeared, stopped at significant locations for the functioning of the drug economy and the execution of the drug war. They visited all the major border cities where Mexican imports, including drugs, crossed into the United States, San Diego, El Paso, Nogales, Laredo. They visited the south side of Chicago to meet with the families of those incarcerated for drug-related crimes. They destroyed guns in a Houston parking lot outside of a gun shop to underscore the devastating effect of U.S. manufactured arms that are smuggled, smuggled into Mexico, as Mexico produces no guns itself, not one. They met with congressional leaders, of course, but they didn't listen. The most moving stop they made, in my view, was at Fort Benning, the new home of the former School of the Americas. The caravaners staged a die-in in front of the school, reminding the U.S. that the Mexican military who today carry out the drug war are trained and armed by the U.S. military. It's not simply that the military accidentally killed innocent bystanders in persecuting drug lords, drug lords and their underlings, although there, although there is an inordinate amount of collateral damage at the hands of the military. It is that the Mexican military, trained by the U.S. in the most advanced killing and counterinsurgency techniques, often switches sides in the drug war, lured by the large sums of easy money. Indeed, the most notorious drug cartel of them all, Los Zetas, were originally an army battalion of Mexican special forces trained by the U.S. at the School of the Americas in counterinsurgency tactics and drug interdiction. They initially defected to work for the Gulf Cartel in the 1990s during Calderón's drug war in a response to a power vacuum created by the successful arrest and extraction of the, cartel, of the Gulf Cartel leaders, the Zetas branched out on their own. They are the largest cartel in territory, employing the most brutal tactics in killing. Allegedly, they introduced the practices of beheading and scalping as a form of terror and intimidation. As the peace activists remind us, asesinos no hacen, se, perdón, los asesinos no nacen, se hacen aquí. The assassins aren't born, they are made here. Narcos are not born as the contemporary iteration of the Indio Barbaro, as Trump and Peña Nieto would have us believe. Narcos are made out of the economic and political conjunction of free trade and the drunk trade. 
And so I would like to end by suggesting that perhaps the true Barbaros del Norte reside at Fort Benning. Thank you.